Welcome, aloha. Welcome to Talk Story with John Waihe. Today we have a very, very interesting show for you. It's actually a matter that's been in the courts for some time, and it relates to the Hawaiian Homes Program. Now, when my very, very first show, I had the honor, actually, the opportunity to actually interview Moses Heyer. Moses Heyer was the director, or is the director, of the Native Hawaiian Legal Corporation. And what the Native Hawaiian Legal Corporation had done was sue the state of Hawaii for not fulfilling its, con uh, its constitutional um, mandate. What is that all about? Well, we're going to find out this coming Thursday when the Supreme Court takes up the case. Here's a little history of the case. It actually began as a lawsuit uh, to enforce the mandate in our Hawaii state constitution that requires that the state fund the administrative and operational costs of the Hawaiian Homes Program. It went before the court, including the Supreme Court, on that issue. And the Supreme Court, the lower court and the Supreme Court, both, mand uh, both upheld the mandate and said that the state of Hawaii was, in a, was uh, breaching its duty because it had failed to provide funding for the Hawaiian Homes Program. The issue then became, how much funding? What was that, what does that mean? And it went back to the lower court to decide that issue. The result of the lower court's trial was that it held, the judge held, that a minimum of $28 million a year was necessary to meet that, federal, that uh, constitutional mandate. This Thursday, that matter is up in appeal. What happened was that the Hawaii State Legislature among, uh, appealed that decision on the basis was one of the parents of that decision on the basis that it violated the state separation of doctrine uh, 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 rule. And what that means is that usually a legislature is there for appropriating money, the executive uh, implements program, and then you have the situation where the court uh, besides whether all of that is, I guess, quote, uh, kosher, unquote. The legislature is challenging whether the, the, the trial court's decision violated that separation of power. The people, the Hawaiian homes, the uh, plaintiffs, or I should say, yeah, plaintiffs, uh, are challenging that position by saying, this is a constitutional mandate, and a constitutional mandate trumps any kind, to use a phrase, trumps any kind of separation of power stock. This is the background to today's this, uh, program. I apologize for its length, but this important issue will be before the Hawaii Supreme Court in just a few days. Now, my guest today is the Deputy Director 
of the Hawaiian Homes Program, Mr. William Isla. And I thought it would be very interesting to discuss with him how we got to where we are. So, Bill, are you, uh, are you joining us? I'm here, Governor. Okay. So, Bill, uh, unfortunately, there's, there, there you are. At, at least I get to see you smiling. Great leg. But <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Bill is actually out in Waianae working. So, this is the, you know, an example of modern technological management. Bill, thank you. Thank you for agreeing to do this show. Um, uh, you know, let's, let's start from the beginning. The Hawaiian Homes Program was established through the efforts of Prince Kohil uh, approximately, oh, I don't know, over, over 100 years ago in, uh, in 1920. Yeah, no, not quite 100 years ago. Um, well, and I, it, I believe, uh, it said governor, I believe Prince Kohio and, and the folks who assisted him actually began prior to the 1920, uh, laying the groundwork for what would become the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act. Fantastic. What, what, what is the act, and what was it supposed to do? Well, the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act, uh, as passed by Congress, um, is, has four purposes. One is for the creation of uh, lots for residential um, agricultural and pastoral uh, leases. The second is to make monies available for loans for those uh, lots that were awarded. The third, um, uh, I guess, uh, the third purpose of the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act is the rehabilitation of, of Native Hawaiians. And then, of course, the, for, the fourth purpose is what we're going to discuss today is the uh, administrative and operating costs to run the program. Okay, let me, you know, if 1920 was just about 20 years after the United States took over Hawaii. And if I remember correctly, Prince Kohio was very concerned that his people may be dying out uh, in, their own, uh, in their own land and uh, may not even have the means to keep up with the changes that were happening here. Is that pretty much what the program was uh, established to, to do? It, it was. It was to get people back on, on the land because uh, Prince Kohio uh, was observing the um, uh, Native Hawaiians that were uh, removed from access to ancestral lands uh, were heading to the urban centers of each island um, becoming uh, part of the tenements uh, that were evolving and succumbing to, you know, early... What you're um, talking about is like little slums, uh, right? They were moving in. Yeah, they were uh, alienated yeah, they were from their off, land. Off of, the, off of the Aina, which, you know, they're closely related to, into uh, basically the ghettos of the, the time and suffering from diseases. So the idea was to put... Native Hawaiians back on uh, on the land that you know they have uh, a bond with. Well, that, you know, so that's a that was the laudable um, uh, purpose. Now, how successful was Kuhio in getting lands for these uh, for his fellow people? I think he was very successful. He got Congress to set aside uh, about 203,000 acres. Uh, some of it is very, very good land. Others, um, not so good land, but at least it forms a, the corpus of the Department of Hawaiian Homelands um, trust that we have. Well, so, so there are good lands and there are not so good lands, right? So let's take the time yes. period between 1970. 1920 to 1958, when we became a state. Essentially, the program was administered by de the then territorial government, which really was a, an extension of the federal government in Washington, was it not? That is correct. And um, unfortunately, the um, 
territorial government did not receive uh, a lot of financial aid from the federal government, and the department at that time, or the precursor of the department at that time, had to rely upon the revenues uh, from land that the department leased to other folks. So there wasn't a lot of money uh, available to do uh, lot preparation loans and, and for rehabilitative projects. So we just discussed a little earlier that there were good lands and some not so good land, to put it uh, politely. So it would seem to me that in order to generate income, you start leasing the good land. Is that pretty much, I mean, this is a sim little simplistic, but uh, would you say overall I'm, I was correct with I would, I would say you're, you're correct, Governor, with a little caveat. So the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act also required that any lands that were still being leased could continue to be leased until the end of the term of the lease. So much wow. of the good land, which was leased to uh, Parker Ranch and uh, sugar plantations at that time, continued to be held um, in the lessee's hands uh, and were not available for homesteading until those leases expired. So, so these lands, that the best lands in a sense, that were already being used by somebody else had their leases protected. So not only did you have to lease good lands to raise revenues, you also inherited probably leases that didn't pay all that well of the best lands. Would you would that be a correct uh, analysis that, of what you just accurate, told me? An accurate statement, Governor. Well, I tell you. Um, and that brings us to statehood. And so there is, in Hawaii now, with the passage of statehood, an opportunity for uh, local, the local government to uh, run the program. And, you know, let's see if they did any better than the Fed, which uh, brings us to today's conversation. Um, I think at this point, we're uh, going to take a short break, and we'll be right back. For those of you that want to call in, the number is 415-871-2474. To Sister Power. I'm your host, Sharon Thomas Yarbrough, where we motivate, educate, empower, and inspire all women. We are live here every other Thursday at 4 p.m., and we welcome you to join us here at Sister Power. Aloha and thank you. Aloha. I'm Tim Apachaw, host for Moving Hawaii Forward, a show dedicated to transportation issues and traffic. We identify those areas where we do have problems in the state, but also the show is dedicated to trying to find solutions, not just detail our problems. So join me every other Tuesday on Moving Hawaii Forward. I'm Tim Apicella. Welcome back to Talk Story with John Wahe. Our guest today is Mr. William Isla, who is the Deputy Director of the Hawaiian Homes Program. We are discussing a little bit of the background uh, that lead, led us to a Supreme Court case, which will be decided uh, in, in this coming Thursday. You know, Bill, you know, this is today, and I, I don't normally do this, you know, identify dates when we, when we have these programs, but today is the day before the 4th of July. And I thought, it might be beneficial uh, for people to know that our statehood in 1959 was in a sense conditioned on the local government, the state government, agreeing to um, undertake the fiduciary responsibility for the Hawaiian Homes Program. Is that correct? Uh, that is that is that is correct. It is a condition of statehood and and laid out in the Admissions Act. So it's pretty much, uh, you know, um, if we, it was pretty much, you know, you want to be a state, which 
many, many people in Hawaii obviously want it to be, uh, you needed to take on this special obligation. I, I, I don't think, does anyone dispute that? I have not heard one person say that that's not uh, in dispute. So that's pretty much settled. Now, we now come to the state government uh, taking over the program. Uh, and the specific issue in mind is the funding of administrative and operational costs to run the program, much less, you know, uh, everything else that, that needed to be done. So the real, let's begin with the obvious question. Did the state pick up the responsibility that they, uh, that they agreed to as a condition of their uh, statehood? Did the government of Hawaii do that? I think the, the short answer is the department certainly uh, does not agree, and then you have the plaintiffs uh, with uh, Dickie Nelson leading um, this uh, current court case uh, referred to as the, the Nelson case. Right, which is the case that's before the Supreme Court. I guess it's called Nelson II. Where, yes, yes, where, and it, it, go ahead. we're here today because the state, because the state of Hawaii, when it became a state, um, and assumed responsibilities for the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act, um, has not fulfilled its duties. So again, you were paying, uh, how was the department surviving? Uh, the department uh, continued until very recently, I think when uh, uh, Governor Abercrombie and later Governor Ige started uh, to um, put in the budget some general funds to pay for part of the administrative and operating costs, but not up to the amount that was decided upon um, by, by the court. Uh, Judge Cascanetti. Okay, I want to take the twin, which is the twin, the twenty-eight million dollars that you referred to. Right. So now we have nineteen fifty-nine. State takes over the administration of the program, doesn't really support it. Were there any, and, 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 and let's take from, go from 1959 to 1978. There's another milestone with the uh, Constitutional Convention in 1978. But what happens is that the state takes over the program and, and doesn't really fund it. Would you say that's a fair statement? That is a fair statement. Okay. Now, did they do that with any other department? Was there any other no, department they... in the state government where the government didn't fund it and told it and told them you go out there and raise your own money? No, and in fact, no other state uh, agency is mandated uh, or highlighted in the Constitution or in the Admissions Act. So the, the condition we're, of our state... We're the only one with that, with that relationship and not being funded appropriately. And so they don't fund the program, essentially. And, and, and as a result, were you, was the department able to put a, a lot of people on, in house lots? Or what, what, what happened for those years leading up to 1979? If you, if you have any uh, idea... I think we'd appreciate hearing. Uh, I think that you know, the people in the department at the time did the best that they could given the limited resources that they had. Um, but as a result, there, there was not a lot of lots or a lot of homes being um, issued to people on the wait list. And as such, um, many folks are still waiting for uh, their opportunities. You know, I, we are now getting, I hate to confess this, because it makes me a little more senior, but I will, okay? The 70s was sort of my era, leading up to when I was, you know, getting active and being, participating in things. And I distinctly remember in 1974, a group called the Hawaiian went up to Waimea on the Big Island and staged the protest against all the lands that Parker Ranch had 
And these were essentially people who were on the waiting list. Uh, I, and the, uh, the, one of the most famous leaders of it was uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Uncle Sonny Canijo, um, Joe Tassel. Well, you know, these are people. All of that firmine in the uh, 1970s was based on the fact that this not enough lots were getting out. Um, were you at all aware of all of these things that were happening back then? Yeah, unfortunately, it was a combination of not being, not having resources to put the lots in the hands of our beneficiaries, and at the same time, you know, relying on uh, the revenue from those leases to run the department. So it was a very, very tough catch-22 situation to be in. You know, I was uh, I, I was a member of the um, the uh, 1978 Constitutional Convention, and I remember. Prior to the convention, the home, uh, Hawaiian Homes director was this wonderful woman, uh, Georgina Haddock. And uh, Georgina seemed to spend all her time trying to do something to increase the economic viability of the Hawaiian Homes program. And, um, and, 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 but all of the money she raised was actually going to pay it to just for the staff. It, it, it wasn't being raised, which was her dream, was to raise enough to, you know, sponsor programs, things like that. How much of that has actually changed? Um, not much. Um, we, we have received um, some administrative uh, general funding uh, to pay for existing staff, and um, the legislature has, uh, has actually appropriated additional positions, but um, we're, we're in a process of filling those positions so that we can respond to the many questions that come from our beneficiaries um, in terms of, you know, what's required for a lease, how do you pass it down. The Department of Hawaiian Homelands does more than just issue leases. It It basically runs a, a probate system when um, a lease is passed from one person to another. Right. It runs a re recordation system. So there are many other functions that the department um, re is in need of these additional administrative and operating costs so that all of the revenue from the land leases and rents can then go into lot uh, preparation. So you, 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 um, you have to prepare a lot, you have to do economic development, and you, you, it's not simply a question of uh, handing out leases. I mean, you, you've got to do genealogy check. I mean, there's a ton of things that the department is required to do, and it remained for a long time. Uh, Bill? I was going to say, Governor, in addition, one that you know most people don't realize is we run four water systems. So just look at the Molokai Ho'olehua oh. water system. It's right. the biggest one on Molokai. And so you know, we, we basically run the equivalent of a county system, um, and, and that comes from the receipts uh, and, the, and the trust funds because the current um, ad administration has decided that those those costs do not count as administrative and operating costs. Wow. Okay. Well, I, I, I'll tell you. In um, what we what we had in 1978 was that I, as one of the delegates there, we we went to the convention, and we knew, and we talked to the uh, Georgiana Patikin and others, and we came out with this mandate that sufficient funds had to be appropriated to the Department of Hawaiian Home. That created the basis for this Nelson case. The idea was, after messing up for, at that time, 78 years, surely there was a, a need to mandate that these things be done. So it's a constitutional requirement in Hawaii uh, for us to uh, fund the, con the Hawaiian Homes program. Isn't that correct? That is correct, and the committee and eventually the um, convention delegates and then ratified through a vote by all of the voters in Hawaii agreed to change the may, the word may, 
fund to shall. And that was a conscious effort to get the legislature and the administration to pay the administrative and operating costs of the department. You know, it, so that the other funds would be available. So that funds would be available to actually put people on the land. So here, what, 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 what we had is then, uh, it seemed to me, the one department that never got support, all of a sudden was mandated. It was required to be funded. Now the Hawaiian Homes Program, so let's review this. Hawaiian Homes Program is the basis, of, uh, was the necessary from Kuhio's uh, idea of rehabilitating people. It was never funded, and, and when we became a state, it was actually a requirement of, the, of our statehood. And in 1978, we are, the, our constitution passed by the people required them to do that. So, here we are today. And on Thursday, Bill, we are going to find out whether the constitution of Hawaii Hawaii's constitution and its obligation is actually very effective. You know, we're just out of time. I thank you, and I want to thank you so much for helping me put the issues into perspective. Bill, I, I know that this is an important day. You're out working in Hawaii, and I, and I truly want to thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Governor, for helping us get, get out the word. Thank you, and aloha, everyone, for listening. Thank you.